Okay, I see that we are recording. And I see that our first speaker, our first team of speakers are up. So I am, am I still have 314 and I'm still seeing people come in a little bit. So I'll just start by saying that it's really good to see you, Dr. Dr. Vanderbrook and, and Ella, Ina and Ella. And um, I will introduce you as soon as as we hit 315. I don't see any more people streaming in right now. So I see 315. Just acquired one more participant. Uh, I am Barbara Sorkin, for those of you who um, were not at my talk just a little while ago. I am delighted to welcome you to the ODS Practicum's breakout session 2C on botanicals and health from traditional use to the 21st century, or traditionally starting with traditional use in the 21st century. So we, I have, um, we have, I think, a fabulous set of speakers for you this afternoon. And they are going to take a deeper dive into a variety of topics around the use of botanical dietary supplements or botanicals themselves for health. And then I hope we'll have a little time at the end to talk about some of the challenges and advantages of using chemically complex botanicals, whether natural or slightly refined, um, as opposed to single phytochemicals. So our first two speakers, are going to be, and I'll introduce them both because they're going to tag team, I believe. And I'll start with Dr. Vanderbrook. Dr. Ina Vanderbrook received her bachelor's in biology and her PhD in medical sciences from the University of Ghent in Belgium. And I apologize if I'm mangling the production, the, the pronunciation. Um, until November of 2021, Dr. Vanderbrook was the Caribbean program director at the New York Botanical Garden, where she worked on an online teaching curriculum the Caribbean and Latino Ethnobotany and Ethnomedicine Medical Educational Education Curriculum. This curriculum, CARLO E2 for short, is based on the results of urban ethnobotany research involving interviews about plant use for healthcare with 400 Caribbean and Latino community members living in New York City. This teaching curriculum, CARLO E2, aims to help the next generation of medical students and physicians improve cultural sensitivity during clinical encounters. Dr. Vanderbrook joined the University of the West Indies, Mona, in Jamaica in 2021 as a senior lecturer in the Department of Life Sciences and senior research fellow at the Nat Natural Products Institute there. Her work at UWI Mona focuses on understanding patterns of traditional plant use for health, well-being, diet, and subsistence in the Caribbean and in Caribbean diaspora communities in New York City using data from ethnobotany surveys and from botanical collections. In Jamaica, she collaborates with local communities to study the plant diversity and cultural importance of root tonics, which are fermented beverages made with wild harvested plants. Some of the source plants are vulnerable to extinction. So Dr. Vanderbrook also directs a project in the John Crow Mountains, a national park and UNESCO World Heritage Site in Northeast Jamaica studying the conservation status of an overharvested endemic tree, Cinnamodendron corticosum of the Canalaceae, the bark of which is used as a spice. And you will also hear in the first presentation from Ella Vardaman. Um, Ella is a PhD candidate at the City University of New York and the New York Botanical Garden Plant Sciences Program under the joint mentorship of Dr. Vanderbrook and Dr. Ed Kennelly of the City University of New York. Her research focuses on ethnopharmacology of plants used by Haitian immigrants in New York City for women's health. Her work contributes to a larger cultural competency program currently under development at the New York Botanical Garden that relays the results of urban ethnobotany projects to medical students and physicians. Ella is currently the student representative of the Society for Economic Botany and is a recipient of the Ruth L. Kirstein Predoctoral Individual National Research Service Award through the NIH's Office of Dietary Supplements and National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. In 2020, she received the Garden Club of America's Anne S. Chatham Fellowship for Medicinal Plant Research. And I'm so delighted to have both of you with us today. Um, why don't you start sharing and take it away? 
I, I will let you know if we're having trouble seeing your screen or hearing you, I promise. Thank you very much, Barbara. I am going to display full screen mode. Adjust this here. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here and share the results of our Caribbean and Latino ethnomedicine and ethnobotany program with you today. In short, Carlo E2. Um, as Barbara said, my name is Ina van der Broek. I am a senior lecturer and an ethnobotany researcher at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. And together with Ella Vardaman, who is a, a PhD candidate at the City University of New York in the New York Botanical Garden, together we will be presenting the results of our Caribbean and Latino ethnobotany and ethnomedicine program, talking in particular about the foods that are used as medicines, that have a double function as medicines by um, Caribbean and Latino New Yorkers. We will also share how we, will, how, are, how we are planning to use the results of our research to help improve the clinical encounter and uh, communication between Caribbean and Latino patients and their healthcare providers. But before I delve deeper into our um, ethnobotany research, how do we define a medicinal plant? In our case, as ethnobotanists, we look at any plant that is used in its raw or unprocessed form to treat or cure or prevent physical health, but not only physical health um, and health symptoms, but also uh, spiritual well-being, social well-being, emotional well-being. So this includes plants that are primarily used as foods, but double in function as medicines. So we're dealing with the traditional knowledge of Caribbean and Latino communities. And it's important to keep in mind that even though it is rooted in tradition, it's not stuck in the past and it's not something from the past either. It is dynamic knowledge that constantly adapt adapts itself, for example, um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this knowledge or this knowledge system, one could say, represents the cultural heritage of these communities. So there is also a social justice component to our research. So how then do we define a food medicine? And this is a continuum from plants that are consumed regularly. Um, they are consumed without uh, treating any specific health concerns. It, it, um, they're used, the edible parts are used and they tend to be less bitter than plant species that are only used as medicines, which are on the opposite end of the continuum. They're also generally regarded as safe. So on the opposite side, we have the medicines only used, uh, only taken when ill, uh, used for specific health problems. And those have, uh, can have parts that are edible, but also inedible parts. Think for example about bark and roots. Compared to the food plants, these species tend to be more bitter and knowledge about them tends to be held by a specialist healer and there is a dose effect relationship. Now the ones in the middle of this continuum are the food medicines. And again, this is a diverse group. Um, it includes many spices and condiments, morning and evening teas, uh, traditional food remedies, and also those foods considered healthy. Think about eating broccoli, are supplementary foods. Think about eating beets to uh, improve iron levels in the blood. 
So as I said before, we are dealing with the cultural heritage, the traditional knowledge systems of Caribbean and Latino communities. And it's important to keep in mind that there are two ways of looking at this. One from the insiders, our emic perspective. These are people from the community and their experiences and perceptions are shaped by cultures and those inform their worldview. And those worldviews are important for understanding what is illness, what is health, and how this should be treated. This type of emic perspective is contextual and place-based. And I want to contrast this with the ethic perspective. That's the perspective of scientists like ethnobotanists, our healthcare providers. And their way of looking at things is achieving academic consensus around a health problem. Um, through hypothesis testing and development of theory, and they aim to be universal. So when we're talking about traditional medical systems or use of medicinal plants, it's important to keep in mind these two type, types of perspectives, the emic or insider's perspective and the ethic or outsider's perspective. So let's delve into our urban ethnobotany research in New York City. I was at New York Botanical Garden for 16 years and in 2005 I started working with the community of Dominican immigrants in the United States. And at first I myself am from Belgium. I came as a postdoc to work on an NIH grant uh, at the New York Botanical Garden working with Dominican immigrants. And at first I thought, well, you know, I'm interested in the link, close link between people and plants. And here we are in an urban environment like New York, New York City. There won't be many plants, raw plants to be found there. And that was a big mistake because when people migrate to the US, they may prefer to use to continue using their cultural knowledge systems that include medicinal plants for their health or consult with traditional re uh, healers for many reasons, including difficulties they may have in accessing biomedical health care, language barriers, but also very much their cultural traditions and beliefs. And in the picture on the top left, you see a botanica shop uh, next to an urgent healthcare center. So here you have traditional medicine and uh, biomedicine existing, coexisting side by side, and they're performing complementary roles. So in the picture at the bottom, you, you, you have a look inside the botanica where one of the staff members is holding in his hands a raw plant that he got from Florida and in his other hand um, a dried and chopped up plant exactly the same species but it's packaged and all these remedies that are culturally important are available in these botanicas. So we know from the literature that there is a high rate of using medicinal plants among Caribbean and Latino com communities. We also know that there are very significant knowledge gaps. Uh, we don't know how many plant species or for what illnesses these communities are using their medicinal plants. We also don't know what the um, botanical identity, the scientific species names of these plant remedies are. We don't know little about, or not much at all about their efficacy and safety. So there was a real significant need to document uh, this type of traditional knowledge. I am jumping now, trying to go back instead of forward. Apologies, let me pop 
apologies for this interruption. So like I said, when I came to the New York Botanical Garden in 2005, I started working with the Dominican community. Um, and when I left in 2021, we had expanded it to include uh, more communities, uh, namely uh, immigrants from the Dominican Republic. So people born uh, outside mainland USA, uh, people from Mexico, Jamaica, and also from Puerto Rico. And these are the top 10 foreign born communities in New York City. And then Ella, who will be talking next, she's working, uh, collaborating with the Haitian community in New York City. So as you can see, uh, there are about, and this is a data from the 2015 American Community Survey, there are about 3.3 million New Yorkers born abroad are in Puerto Rico. And, and one in four of those born abroad um, are members of the Mexican, Dominican, Jamaican, and Puerto Rican communities. So our program, like I said, acronym is CARLO E2, looking into their use of medicinal plants for healthcare. Not sure. Okay, so our model for comparative uh, ethnobotany and ethnomedicine uh, research is looking to, un to better understand patterns of traditional knowledge and use of medicinal plants among these communities. So we wanted to know which are the health conditions that are prevalently treated with plants, which are the plant species that are most culturally important as medicines, then if we compare these communities, how similar are, how different is their medicinal plant knowledge? And finally, does mig migration bring about changes in people's knowledge and use of medicinal plants? So this is our 2017-2080 uh, Carlo survey in New York City, and that was before the pandemic hit. So we interviewed 400 people, uh, 100 in each community. Um, they were 18 years or older and born outside the mainland US and had some self-declared knowledge of medicinal plants. Our survey questionnaire asked them to free list plant remedies and health conditions they use these remedies for. And we also asked open-ended, semi-structured and structured questions. So here is a snapshot of our database uh, that deals with the free listing of plant remedies. Highlighted in yellow, and these are data, interview ID numbers from a subset of Jamaican participants. Um, and as you can see here, and I've highlighted it in yellow, you see three different names, local or common names of plants. And then subsequently, through our plant identification and plant collection, we found out that these are actually uh, belonging to one and the same species. And this is within one community, only the Jamaican community. So in total, we had about 13,000 used reports of someone saying, I use this plant to treat that kind of illnesses illness and this this involves 527 species so if you look at this snapshot in our database you can see that it's about the plant part the illness treated and the preparation and again there is a lot of diversity in what people report about using medicinal plants concerning the part of the plant that is used the type of preparation method and how this plant remedy is administered. So there are significant knowledge gaps to be filled. So after our survey, we would get a very long list of these common or local names, for example, Sen. So then the next step would be to collect those plant specimens based on those common names from Botanicas to purchase them there and then use botanical keys and our resources and methodology available to us as 
botanist to authenticate to authenticate, to unambiguously cross-link these common and scientific names. And of course, also, you know, have the plant samples available for reference along with all that information. This is very important. Why? Let's look at a very common plant remedy. It's used by different communities. And what do we see here? We see different species. On the left, we have our dandelion, as many of us outside those four communities will know it. In Spanish, it's Diente de Leon. But then when uh, Jamaicans talk about dandelion and you see that species to the right, a composite picture, it's a very different species, even belonging to very different botanical families. The one to the right is a legume and the one to the left is a sunflower. So if you do not know this information, you're in trouble. Why? Let's take this plant species as an example. This is called tuna. Imagine you want to know about the efficacy or uh, toxicity of this species known as tuna, which after a botanical identification was um, known was known in the botanical literature as Opuntia cochinellifera. Its synonym is Nopalea cochinellifera. So if you search PubMed based on tuna and safety, you get a lot of records for heavy metal accumulation in tuna fish. This is absolutely not what you want. You want to know about the species. So then you need to know the scientific name. And when you put that in uh, PubMed, one of the things that pops up is a small pilot clinical study in Mexico where a beverage of tuna was given to patients with diabetes. And there was some very uh, minor um, increases in um, blood glucose levels that were observed. So we need to authenticate these plant medicines in order to know what is known about them in the biomedical literature. So let's have a look now at some of the results of our research. And this is also, again, it's blowing my mind. We're in New York City. We're in a big metropolis. Um, this shows each community of 100 people in total mentioned more than 200 different medicinal plant species. Imagine that, right? So this shows that these plants are so culturally important for these communities that they bring them with them when they migrate and they are available through the network of botanicas in the city. We also asked ourselves, so these are in total 527 different botanical species that we identified. We also asked ourselves how much overlap is there, is, is there between these four communities. And there were 87 plant species that were reported by all four communities. That's 17% of the 527 species. And below, um, I've put some images of species that are popularly uh, known across and, and across these four communities. Uh, and you will probably recognize um, most of them. Um, what we can also see is that there are four of these very popular species are foods, um, lime, ginger, soursop, and garlic. So this uh, brought us to consider the topic of foods as medicines as a separate uh, sub research line. So we asked ourselves then next, um, which are the most popular food medicines across Caribbean and Latino communities? Um, and here with the color codes, you see the different communities. Some, if we look at soursop, um, are more important um, across the Caribbean communities, Dominicans, Jamaicans, Puerto Ricans, and other Another species like onion is more important in Latino communities like Mexicans, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans. So there are um, cultural differences. There are also cultural similarities. Foods also turned out to be the most 
prevalent remedies that were reported for eight of the top 10, 10 cited illnesses. Remember, in our free listing, we asked people um, about um, the health conditions that they treated with medicinal plants. And here you see the ranking of these conditions based on frequency of mention, and then also um, the proportional reporting of foods in green. Um, remember the sour sop um, icon, and then the pure medicines, uh, as I would call them, in uh, yellowish brown. So you see here that for eight of the top 10 illnesses treated with plants, foods were the most prevalently cited remedies. And the only ones that uh, for which this was not the case uh, are stress and nervousness and burns and wounds. Well, sometimes it's not the name of a plant in Caribbean and Latino communities is not the name, the standard name in standard common name in the United States. Um, oregano turns out to be a Caribbean oregano, which is a very different species from the Mediter Mediterranean oregano that is commonly used on pizzas. When Jamaicans talk about pear, it turns out to be an avocado. When Dominicans talk about cereza, which is Spanish for cherry, it turns out to be an acerola cherry, a very different species from the cherry known in America, North America or Europe. And pine for the Jamaican community is pineapple. So what you see here also is that for several of these foods that are used as medicines, there is no data about their contraindications, drug interactions, or precautions. Again, a, a significant gap in the literature to fill. So what do we want to do now with our research results? Well, we are developing curricular materials and also training exercises with healthcare providers um, to improve cross-cultural awareness, understanding, and sensitivity. Basically, to empower patients and providers to have a mutually respectful dialogue about different treatment modalities. And last but not least, that uh, Caribbean patients uh, feel that there is a trusted relationship with their providers to disclose their use of herbal remedies. And here you see some um, modules of this curricular curriculum that we are developing. Uh, we're talking, for example, about culture-bound illnesses or folk illnesses. We have a separate module on botanicas. We have a module on foods as medicines. We talk about selected plant mon monographs. So these are PowerPoint presentations that can be used in workshops, uh, ground rounds, um, and any kind of interaction. We also had um, healthcare providers come to the New York Botanical Garden and um, discuss plant remedies for important for Caribbean and Latino communities in the tropical living plant collection and so on. And with this, I will give the word now to Ella Vardaman, who will talk about expanding our research with the Haitian community in New York City. Thank Go ahead, you. Ella. Thank you. So as Ina said, I'm Ella Vardaman. I'm a PhD candidate at the City University of New York and the New York Botanical Garden. I'm co-mentored by Dr. Vanderbrook, but also by Dr. Edward Canelli at Lehman College in the Bronx. And my thesis focuses on the ethnopharmacology of medicinal plants for Haitian women's health. Next slide, please. So my work is really focused on building upon the foundation of work that Dr. Vanderbrook had with the Carla communities in New York, both in terms of methodology, but then also I used her data set with the New York City Dominican community to lay a foundation for my work with the Haitian community who we had not previously collaborated before. I use data with the Dominican community because Haiti and the Dominican Republic have something in common. They're both located on the island of Hispaniola and the Caribbean. 
Haiti is located on the western portion of the island and the Dominican Republic is located on the eastern portion. And so even though these are two very different cultures and there's this political divide between the two countries on the island, there's a shared flora across the island of Hispaniola. So a shared repository of plants that can be used for medicine in both countries. And one of the really big questions of my PhD is how did these two really different cultures who have the same plants available to them in the Caribbean, what happens when they come to New York City? And they also have the same plants available to them in the greengrocers, markets, botanicas, and parks. Next slide, please. So typically when you do an ethnopharmacological study of this kind, you start out with your survey. So the original plan was I was gonna go out into the Haitian community, talk with people about what plants they use for women's health. And then if there were plant species that had particular interests, I would go back and look at those in the lab for their phytochemistry and their bioactivity. That's not what happened because I started my PhD and then the COVID-19 pandemic happened and I wasn't able to do my survey first. So I, me and my mentors, we came up with this reverse engineered approach to get around the issue. So I used previous data that Dr. Vanderbrook had collected in New York City with the New York City Dominican community, as well as in the Caribbean, so Dominican community in the Caribbean. And I compared that to what was already known about Haitian medicinal plants from the literature. Using those data sets, I made cross-cultural comparisons and then hypothesized plant species that would be relevant to the Haitian community in New York City for women's health. I used that list to go ahead and start my laboratory studies so I wouldn't get too behind on my PhD, but also that served as a hypothesis for my work uh, when I actually was able to do my survey in the Haitian community. So now that I have completed my survey, I've been able to validate or reject the hypotheses that these plants were used, as well as identify new species that can be looked at in further laboratory studies. Next slide, please. So the aim of this work is to compare patterns of traditional knowledge and use of medicinal plants between the New York City Haitian community and the Dominican community. And so kind of the first research question was more of like setting the baseline. So we knew a lot about what was used for, for women's health in the New York City Dominican community. Does the New York City Haitian community have plant knowledge for women's health that's comparable to that? And then the second question is to follow up on that reverse engineered approach. So do New York City Haitians and Dominicans share similar culturally important plants for women's health. Next slide. So as I said, I followed a similar methodology to Dr. Vanderbrook. I had 100 interviews with Haitian women. Everybody was 18 years old or older and then born in Haiti and was now living in New York City. And my questionnaire included structured questions about plant use both before and after migration, as well as a list of women's health conditions where I asked people to free list remedies that they knew for these conditions. Next slide, please. So I conducted my interviews in Brooklyn and Queens. I would say most of my interviews were conducted in Flatbush, Brooklyn, which is also known as Little Haiti. And one of the most significant results that I found was that 97% of participants, so 97 out of 100 people I talked to, were using medicinal plants while they were living in Haiti. And although that number, number dropped significantly after when I asked people, okay, are you using plants here? It was not so much, I don't use plants here, it's I don't use plants here yet, as most of the people who don't use plants here yet reported that they had you know, just moved here from Haiti and they just didn't know where to get them. Something else that was really interesting was that plant knowledge was not dependent on age. So older participants who you might assume would know more because of life experience or maybe time spent in Haiti, um, knew the same average number of plant species as younger participants. And then plant knowledge was also not dependent on years spent in the US or years outside of Haiti. So again, people who have been here for decades knew the same number of medicinal plants for women's health as people who have moved here maybe like two months ago. Next slide, please. When we looked at the popularly reported plants for women's health in the Haitian community, we found similar to other Carlo communities that mostly food plants were used. I did compare the um, percentage of food plants used in the Haitian community to, for women's health to the, to the ones that were used in the Dominican community, and we found that they were actually using more food plants than Dominicans, which is significant since the Dominicans were using the most food plants out of the four groups that Dr. Vanderbrook had interviewed before. I also looked at the origin of top reported plants, and we found that most of the plant species were globally used species from all different areas of the world, and only a small portion of them were actually native to the Caribbean. And the plants that were native to the Caribbean were largely non-food plants. Next slide, please. Here I have a table of the top women's health conditions reported in the Haitian community. 
The top five conditions were birth and proprium, gynecological infections, which included vaginal infections, sexually transmitted infections, and um, urinary tract infections. Vaginal cleansing, women's health tonics, which that was more plants that people took on a regular basis for their reproductive health, and dysmorrhea. And I've compared the proportions of New York City Haitians um, who reported these conditions, and those are the blue bars, and the New York City Dominican community um, in the red bars. Next slide, please. And we've prepared, when we compared these proportions, what we found was there's some women's health conditions like gynecological infections, dysmorrhea, infertility, and contraception that had similar importance between the two groups. So people were reporting using medicinal plants for these conditions at similar le levels. Next slide. But we also found that there was a lot of women's health conditions that were more, were treated more frequently with medicinal plants in the Haitian community. And so if we take a step back and think about what this data means and how we can apply it to models like the Carlo E2 program, you can focus on women's health conditions that have broad importance for, for multiple cultural groups, but then you can also provide specific information that's culturally relevant to specific groups, like for the Haitian community, for some of these women's health conditions that were more important to them. Next slide, please. We also compared the number of top or the overlap in the top reported plants between the New York City Dominican community, that's the blue circle, and the New York City Haitian community, that's the orange circle. The overlapping plants are in the middle, so there were 21 plants that overlapped between the two communities for women's health. And the New York City Haitians did not share as many top reported plants as we had previously hypothesized from that reverse engineered approach. But what we did find is those 21 plants that overlapped, that 48% of those were food plants, so that was really where the biggest overlap between the two communities was. Next slide, please. So some of the conclusions from Dr. Vanderbrook's work, but also my work, is that foods are important medicines for Carla communities, both for the Dominican community, but also for the Haitian community for women's health. Um, popular Carla foods include globally used species, so from areas outside the Caribbean, as well as Carla specific foods. So we found that things like pigeon pea or cachinus cajana, which is that picture on the side here, which is native to Caribbean, were also really important um, for women's health. And then the third conclusion is more relevant to my research is that ground truthing through in-person in, um, surveys is vital to understanding how plants are used within a community. So through the worst reverse engineered approach, we had these assumptions about what would be relevant to the Haitian community. And some things were aligned, but then other things did not. So it was not, we wouldn't have known that without doing the in-person survey work. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'd like to thank the Carlo communities that we collaborated with. Um, Botanica La 21 Division, Haitian Americans United for Progress, um, my mentor, Dr. Edward Kennelly at Lehman College in the Bronx, uh, our funders for the Cigna Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and the Garden Club of America, as well as our institutions at the University of West Indies, the New York Botanical Garden, and the City University of New York. Thank you so much, Ina and Ella, for those fabulous presentations. Um, you're really reopening my eyes to the gorgeous diversity of New York City. Um, and I, I love that photo of the um, Minute Clinic right next to the Botanica. That's, that's a great example of, of the diversity of the city and what's available in it. Um, I am, are there questions from the participants? Um, ah, we have a question from Dr. Samyana. Do you have any insights into why the Haitians used plants more than the Dominicans? I guess that would be a question for you, Ella. Yes. I haven't completely explored that yet, but Dr. Vanderbrook and I are looking at it right now. While we wait for questions to come in, and I'm wondering whether it might be because they have less availability, um, less, less financial access to um, conventional what we would call conventional medical care in, in the US. Um, I have a question while we're waiting for more from the attendees. Um, and that is, to what extent are, are the Caribbean populations in New York using both their traditional approaches and, um, you know, Western medical approaches? To what extent are they combining the Minute Clinic with the Botanica? That's a very important uh, question, Barbara. And this is also one of the questions from our survey. And uh, one of the overwhelmingly frequent responses was 
uh, that if people had access to biomedical care, they would go and get a di diagnosis through biomedical care and um, possibly also um, pharmaceuticals, but they would, in addition, go to their botanica or use their food remedies and use both. They would drink their herbal tea and use their herbal tea to take their pharmaceutical medicine. And the reasoning was, if we do that, if one doesn't cure what we have, the other certainly will. And, you know, I think you it makes sense to use every do everything you can to support your health. You know, I think we would all agree that you should exercise and eat healthy. And if you're running a fever, you should. Um, you know, either do your COVID test or go see your doctor or both. Um, so let's see. And we have from, from Dr. Check, um, she, what a great group of presentations. Yes, check, check, check. Um, she wonders whether based on your work, you would suggest any particular botanical remedies for more research. Great question. I was thinking that too. Um, what botanicals that you think are being widely used are understudied in the literature? Oh, I'm going to bet most, if not all of them, but that's the answer. Exactly. Remember that slide that I put up with the 527 medicines, medicinal botanical species that are uh, research um, revealed. So these very popular ones are definitely uh, studied better than the ones that are Caribbean specific. So I, I think um, I, I would take one of either the more global plant remedies that may not necessarily have um, a lot of information that pertains to the way Caribbean and Latino communities use these species. Let's say um, uh, bitter Ginger. orange diabetes i'm just mentioning something versus also a caribbean remedy because these caribbean medicinal plants native to the area they hardly have any um ethnopharmacology or natural products li research literature to them I, i'd like to chime in on that as well please yes, yes. So with my laboratory work, I think also these plants are, the Caribbean medicinal plants are understudied, but especially in the context of women's health. So I look at plant how plants that are used for gynecological infections are used by Dominican and Haitian communities and their impact on the vaginal microbiota. And that's a very, very understudied area as well. So important. Um, yeah, that better medications for that, better approaches to that could be very, very helpful. I think we would all appreciate that. Certainly all of us with vaginas. Um, so Barbara, also a lot of our study participants were telling us that whenever they had a chronic health problem, that they would get tired of taking so many pharmaceuticals. And people <laughs> would so often tell us, um, you know, pharmaceuticals will help you with one thing in your body uh, take away a pain, but they will affect your liver. They will give you a lot of side effects. They are slowly poisoning us. So people feel like they're losing control over their, their health. And also their use of medicinal plants is a way to reclaim that health. Well, well and we do know that, you know, pharmaceuticals can have side effects. Of course, we know that botanicals can also have side effects. And that's one of the things that, that you and Ella are so importantly exploring. Um, that we have another question that came in, another wonderful presentation. And, ah, great question. Do you see differences in foods and supplements um, related for those with African heritage compared to more native in, um, in, in indigenous American heritage? Exactly. When we looked at the Latino communities, you know, grouping together the Spanish speaking uh, Mexicans and Dominicans and Puerto Ricans, Dominicans and Puerto Ricans would more often refer to their Spanish heritage um, and compare it with a community like the Jamaican communities. And we looked at 
the plant remedies that they were using and where they originated from in the world, in global uh, regions, continents, we did see that the Jamaican community would make more frequently use of remedies that were from the African and Asian continents. And those Latino Spanish speaking communities would use more often uh, and report more often remedies from the Mediterranean origin. Fascinating. Um, I, I think I need, we're running into four o'clock. I hope that we will have a little more time for discussion at the end. But one question that I think I need to ask very importantly is, is your curriculum, is Carlo E2, how broadly available is that? How would people get access to that? That's an excellent question. We're still working on it. And it's something that, that we really need to think about, uh, not only having it on our institution's website whenever it's ready, but to find a way to disseminate it as broadly as possible. That's a conversation to be held. And um, I'm, I'm all ears from input from you and the audience to see how we, how we should best publish this. Well, I think we certainly have fodder here for a bunch of new collaborations. So I'm very excited about that. It is four o'clock. So I need to introduce our next speaker. So we're going now a little bit from the ethnobotany, um, more towards understanding the chemistry and how that works on, um, on, on the person who is consuming the chemistry. And our next speaker is Dr. Nadja Cech. Dr. Cech is the Patricia A. Sullivan Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. A major focus of her laboratory's work is developing novel methodologies to identify combinations of molecules that interact to achieve biological effects via additivity, synergy, or antagonism. Dr. Cech, who has well-deservedly won prizes for both her mentorship and her research publications, is also a principal investigator for the Carbon Center for High Content, Functional Annotation of Natural Products. She is co-director of the Analytical Core for the NCCIH supported Center of Excellence for Natural Product Drug Interactions. And she is co-director of the Medicinal Chemistry Collaborative and it is yours, Nadja. I will let you know if we're having trouble seeing or hearing, seeing your slides or hearing you. Perfect. Thank you. So it's such an honor to be here today and always a pleasure to share the Zoom with all of you. Thank you for the introduction, Barbara, and for the invitation. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, hopefully that works. Um, that works. All right. Well, today I want to talk a little bit about this idea of synergy between the chemical constituents of a dietary supplement and here by dietary supplement, um, I'm going to focus mostly on the category of dietary supplements that is herbal medicines, although I think some of the methodologies and concepts that we're talking about here could apply to other dietary supplements such as probiotics. Um, there's a very widespread hypothesis that you've probably heard of if you've ever had a conversation with anyone about the use of plants for medicine, which is that botanical medicines work differently than pharmaceutical preparations because their complexity leads to synergistic interactions of the multiple chemical constituents that are present. So you might have beneficial effects um, because you have more than one compound that are hitting a target. You might have um, antagonism of one compound by another. You might have additivity that multiple compounds work in similar ways, but are slightly different in their structures. And these are all possibilities. Um, what is a little trickier is how to go about studying these scientifically. And that's been the focus of my research for more than two decades at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And I should not say my research, I should say our research, myself, collaborators, and of course, students who do a lot of the work. So where does this hypothesis come from? Well, if we look at the historical use of plants for medicine, uh, that dates back probably long before it was ever recorded, but some of the earliest recorded writings on the Ebers papyrus from um, 1550 BCE talk about the use of plants for medicine. This particular photo is about a use, um, use of a remedy for asthma that uh, was plants that were burned on a brick and then inhaled by the person who was inflicted by asthma. 
Plasma. So this use of plants dates back thousands and thousands of years. And certainly um, we are really interested in, in the applying rigorous scientific medicine methods to study this, but we are not the first to think about it. Um, my own particular position on this actually comes from my upbringing. So this is me circa 1982. Um, I had a lot of experience working with plants. I'm the one on the left there with the flowers in my hat and um, was very involved in communities of people who use plants for medicine growing up in rural Oregon. And so that's kind of where I first heard the synergy hypothesis. And I would certainly say that it was extensively talked about among those communities that somehow plants could be better for treating disease than single pharmaceuticals because of the idea of synergy. So that's an argument you hear all the time. Um, and now I'm in the fortunate position of being able to try to study that in the research laboratory. And this is just a group of folks that are involved in those studies with me at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. So the definition of synergy is a situation where you have some biological effect that is greater than the effect of any two agents by themselves. So the combined effect is greater than the additive effect. And this is a situation where the most basic principle of math one plus one equals two is defied. And we see one plus one being more than two. Of course, there's other types of situations that can also happen. Additivity where you have more than one compound, but the effect is the overall expected effect. That's still a situation where you would have a difference between a mixture that's complex and a single agent. And of course, we can also have antagonism where there's two things that are working against each other, and that can be relevant as well. So there are several different ways that this synergistic effects can occur um, on a biochemical level. And one of them is, um, so the classical thinking about pharmacology, when we're thinking about simple drugs, a simple uh, pharmaceutical preparations, is the idea that there's a single molecule acting at a single target. Now, the field of pharmacology that studies how molecules interact in biological systems has really expanded in recent years to think about this idea of polypharmacology, where you have single molecules interacting with multiple different targets. And it turns out that in most cases, when you take and consume, when you consume a molecule, it does not just interact with a single target in your body, a single protein. It has multiple different effects. Um, but we can also think about this from the complexity from the chemical standpoint, and that's usually what people mean when they're referring to the idea of synergy. So rather than thinking about multiple targets, we can think about multiple molecules, and those multiple molecules could affect a single target. Um, maybe one of them binds to the binding pocket of an enzyme and another one alters that binding pocket to either enhance or reduce binding. That would be a case of allosteric modulation. Or you could have a situation where you have multiple molecules and they're interacting with multiple different targets in the body with multiple different mechanisms. So as you can see, this can get pretty complicated. You could really have a combination of synergy mechanism two and polypharmacology where you've got multiple molecules hitting multiple different targets in multiple different ways. And this could become very complicated. So is there scientific evidence for the idea, the hypothesis that I posed at the beginning that's so widely discussed in the botanical medicine community, that synergy happens in botanical med medicines. Two of the most commonly used examples of synergy are white willow bark um, is one of them. And white willow bark, as you know, is the source of aspirin, one of the pharmaceutical drugs that we see for treating pain. And certainly this is often the case that the line between a botanical medicine and a pharmaceutical is a little bit of a blurry line because the molecules that we're seeing used medicinally are coming from plants in the first place. But the difference between a botanical dietary supplement and the pharmaceutical preparation would be that in the pharmaceutical preparation, as would be the example with aspirin, you've isolated a single compound um, the acetosalicylic acid. And then in the case of the willow bark, you would be maybe using a tea of willow bark 
or an extract of willow bark that contains other things besides that compound, but presumably also that same compound that's used in the pharmaceutical. So this is an example of a study that was published in 2001 um, that's been widely cited that looked at the efficacy of um, willow bark in osteoarthritis with the randomized placebo-controlled double-blind clinical trial. And as Dr. Betts was talking about earlier today in his introduction, you know, this is really the top of the pyramid in terms of the types of studies we want to see people using. And the investigators did find some efficacy um, of the white willow bark. And they also make this statement um, in their uh, in their evaluation of the findings of the study that the willow bark um, may potentially offer an analgesic therapy, so treating pain with better tolerability than acetosalic ilicylic acid, which is the pure compound from that, or other NSAIDs, um, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But if you look carefully at the design of this study, they were not actually comparing acetosalic ilicylic acid to white willow. Um, they were simply looking at the level of acetosalicylic acid that was present in the preparation and then comparing it to what is used in um, used therapeutically. And they found efficacy at a lower level than what's typically used therapeutically in the study. And so they made the assumption that maybe there was something else going on here, but it's not really, the study was not really designed to test that. Um, and that's actually, that finding is actually somewhat mirrored here by another study. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial of the traditional preparation of Artemisia annua. Um, and Artemisia annua, you might have heard of because it is the source of artemisinin, which is actually the most effective treatment for malaria worldwide um, and is very widely used and saves thousands of lives. Um, was the, in, the person who first discovered this molecule, Dr. Tu Yu Yu, was awarded a Nobel Prize. And it's been a really important life-saving medication. There's been a lot of conversations about whether Artemisia annua T might actually work either similarly to or better than the isolated artemisinin, which is the single active principle that people have used medicinally from this plant. And it's a bit of a controversial topic um, because as you've heard extensively today, there's much bigger challenges characterizing um, botanicals and standardizing them and making sure that they're delivering the predicted amount of artemisinin or of whatever constituent it is that you're interested in um, than it is when you're working with that isolated compound. But at the same time, botanicals can be much more readily available to the communities of people that might use them in areas such as developing countries where there's not access to pharmaceutical drugs or maybe there's a lot of um, illicit um, selling of non of poor quality products or products that don't contain the medicines that they're supposed to contain. So uh, again, this has been a, a bit of a politically charged topic. Um, is it better to make a tea available to people who couldn't maybe afford the medication or is it better to try to get the medication to as many people as possible in its isolated form? And uh, maybe the answer is both. Um, with this clinical study that I'm referencing here, a similar conclusion was drawn, interestingly. Um, so the traditional artemisia preparations that were used in the study contained a smaller amount of artemisinin, 19% um, of the usual clinical dose that's used, and they still saw efficacy in the study. Um, although I will notice, I will make the point that in this study, they saw a, a greater incidence of reoccurring in um, malarial parasite uh, infection with the use of the artemisia tea than they did with quinine, which was the molecule that was used as a comparison. So they actually came to the conclusion that it shouldn't, Artemisia, Artemisia T shouldn't be used alone for um, the treatment of malaria in this particular study. That was the conclusion that they came to. So um, again, though, the study design here was not comparing pure artemisin into Artemisia annua extract at the same concentration and seeing whether or not the same results were observed it was um, extrapolating the results to other studies that have looked at pure artemisia. So that's why I, I highlighted in the title that the term suggesting, um, really the clinical studies that we have access to on these botanicals, even these very much poster children botanicals of the idea of synergy are just suggesting synergy, but haven't necessarily proven it. 
Um, there's some really nice work by Dr. Pamela Weathers, who's an NCCH funded investigator, who's done some nice uh, publications on mouse model work with Artemisia annua as well. So if we go down the pyramid one level from um, clinical studies, the next thing we would think about would be um, an animal study. And of course, Dr. Sorkin mentioned the challenges associated with animal studies um, and with extrapolating those to humans. But at least for this particular animal study, the investigators found that the Artemisia annua extract, in this case, was compared directly to purified artemisinin and from the plant, and there was a 40-fold increase in bioavailability. So this points to the idea that maybe one reason why um, the efficacy could be better for a complex T versus a single molecule would be improved um, adsorption in the body of that compound. And that's something that you're not often going to see in in vitro studies where you're looking just in a test tube and you don't have a whole body for adsorption to happen. Um, so this is one of the challenges with doing studies around synergy is that sometimes the mechanisms for synergy that apply in a whole organism don't apply for in vitro studies that are done in a test tube. So I would say based on these findings that there's really a need for scientific validation of this synergy hypothesis. And to validate it, what we need then are randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies comparing the individual active compounds side by side with complex botanical mixtures. But the challenge here is knowing what the active compounds are, and we've talked about that a lot today, if different botanicals vary in composition when they've been grown under different conditions or prepared in different ways, then when we do a clinical study, what we're studying is not um, a single compound, but a mixture, and it's hard to compare one study to the next if that mixture com composition is going to change. So how do we know then what the active components are so that we can make sure those are present when we do a clinical study. And this is a bit of a chicken egg problem because if we can't find the active compounds unless we do the clinical study, we don't know if we're doing the clinical study on the right material that has the active compounds, that is a conundrum. Um, and the best that we can do is to try to use model systems to get at what the active constituents might be and then study preparations that have those constituents um, and partly that we can do that through in vitro clinical studies, through animal models, but also as with Dr. Vanderbrook and, um, and Ella's presentations earlier today, looking at um, the traditional use of these medications, of these botanicals, and using that to inform our knowledge of um, how to prepare them as well. So when we think about how to identify active constituents of mixtures, um, the traditional approach was that has been in place for a long time in natural products research is what's called bioassay guided fractionation. And it's through bioassay guided fractionation that compounds like artemisinin from Artemisia annua were originally identified and then developed into pharmaceutical preparations. And bioassay guided fractionation is a process by which you take a series of extracts from a botanical source, you do a biological assay on those of some sort. So the biological assay could be studying them in a mouse model or another animal model. It could be studying them in humans if you could do that, but usually you can't um, for various ethical and logistical and expense reasons. Um, and it could be studying them, most commonly what it is, is studying them in a test tube. Um, for example, growing cells in a test tube or growing bacteria in a test tube and doing what's called an in vitro study where you then add those extracts to that um, test tube and see whether they, let's say, kill cancer cells or impact um, the production of inflammatory cytokines by immune cells or whatever the assay might be. And from that, you would identify then an active extract and you would subject that extract to separation using chromatography. So that basically separates the mixtures of separates the mixture of molecules from the plant into a set of pooled fractions that can then be um, tested again in the biological assay. And each one of these fractions contains a subset of the original molecules that were in the original extract. And then you find one of those subsets to be active, as was the case here for fraction three, it's resubjected to the biological assay. And this process continues iteratively until of bioassay separation, identification of active constituents, 
until you eventually would get a pure active compound and you would make sure then to fully characterize it and solve its structure using spectroscopic techniques like nuclear magnetic resonance and mass spectrometry and tools of this nature. But of course, this approach is inherently biased towards the idea that there's a single compound that you're trying to find. So this is the conundrum is that this approach is really good for finding single active compounds. But as you purify and simplify, you lose things that could potentially be contributing to activity. And so we never know for sure when we get down to this pure active molecule, whether we have fully characterized the constituents that are important in the activity of an extract. And so this is what my research lab has thought about a lot, the idea that we could maybe develop analytical approaches that will allow us to find multiple active compounds that are playing a role in activity of botanical medicines. So I want to go through a little case study of one example that we have done that. This is with the plant golden seal, Hydrastis canadensis. Um, it's a plant that's used in traditional medicine, used documented by the Iroquois originally, but certainly was probably used before it was ever documented. Um, this is a plant native to the Eastern hardwood forests of the United States. It contains a molecule called berberine, which is an antimicrobial alkaloid. And in fact, this spot on the root here that you see that's yellow is because of that yellow alkaloid that's in the root. And that molecule um, has an antimicrobial effect on bacteria. So our research group was interested in this plant because we wondered whether it would serve as a good model of the idea that there might be more than one compound responsible for activity. And so we collected a bunch of plant material for golden seal. We harvested this in its native environment in the hardwood forests of North Carolina, but that was it was actually harvested from cultivated golden seal material um, to avoid putting pressure on natural populations of this plant, which is actually threatened in its natural environment. And then we make extracts of that plant material. And this is just a photograph showing how the extract has a beautiful yellow color that comes from that berberine molecule that's present in the plant. And then the biological assay that we use in our experiments is one where we look at the growth of bacteria. So this is way down at the bottom of the pyramid, <laughs> the inexpensive and quick and dirty assay where we grow bacteria and see whether the presence of an extract or a compound from that extract inhibits growth of the bacteria. And what you see in this photograph is here's a solution where bacteria are growing and the solution is very cloudy. And here's a solution where bacteria are not growing and the solution is very clear. And you see there's kind of a concentration gradient of bacteria here. And this mimics the concentration gradient of adding something that inhibits the growth of the bacteria. So as you add something that inhibits the growth of the bacteria, the solution gets clear. And what we do is shine light through the solution and measure how much light can get through. And that tells us um, whether or not we have bacteria growing. So this is the type of data that you get from conducting an assay like that. Um, on the y-axis, we're measuring the absorbance, which is just a measure of how cloudy that solution is. So when you see a high value for absorbance, it means that um, there's a lot of bacteria growing. And when you see a low value, like over here, it means that the bacteria are not growing. And then this is just a comparison of berberine here versus an extract from golden seal, which is the dotted line. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so what we see is that we define this point MIC, which is the minimum inhibitory concentration. It's the minimum concentration needed to completely inhibit the growth of the bacteria. So it's where this curve goes down to zero, where we're not seeing turbidity of the solution anymore. And the lower that value is, the more potent the inhibition is. And for berberine by itself, you see it takes 150 micrograms of that berberine per milliliter of solution to completely inhibit the growth of the bacteria. But when we have golden seal present in an extract, it only takes 35 micrograms per mil to inhibit the growth. So there's something else in the extract that's causing the extract to behave differently than the purified berberine. And this is the idea that we were interested in pursuing then of figuring out what is responsible for that effect. So the question is, which constituents are responsible for the antimicrobial activity of golden seal? So when we're trying to answer this question about multiple constituents in an extract, one of the tools that we use 
is um, a tool called referred to as metabolomics, where we look at multiple compounds all at once using an analytical approach that can de detect a diverse number of molecules from a plant. And one of the best tools for this is high resolution mass spectrometry, which is the tool my research group uses. And essentially with high resolution mass spectrometry, you can collect signals from multiple molecules and then they get displayed in a chromatogram where you see peaks. Each peak is representing a different molecule over time. And the intensity here is the signal detected by the mass spectrometer. And the waxes here is how long it takes for the sample to move through a column. Um, so we have a liquid chromatography column attached to the mass spectrometer and the sample is moving through that column and we're detecting individual molecules as they come off. So metabolomics is a tool where we measure differences in abundance and also just presence and absence of a holistic profile of small molecules of metabolites. And that enables us to get a more global perspective on which constituents might be important in activity. But it's not important to, it's not enough to just look at the chemical composition of the extracts. We also need to think about their biological effects. And so a big part of using metabolomics as a tool for studying botanical medicines is to combine the metabolomics data with biological assay data of some sort, such as the antimicrobial data I was showing you earlier or any other biological assay result. And then some multivariate statistical analysis is needed to compare those two data sets. And the ultimate goal of that is to predict the active compounds based on how the biological data and chemical data are overlaid with each other. And this is something that um, we have published a number of papers on in my group in the recent past. And if anyone is interested in any of these, I will gladly send preprints your way. So just let me know. So going back to the specific example of golden seal, what we did in our study of golden seal was we fractionated the golden seal extract um, and pursued active fractions, just like I talked about in the previous slide with bioassay guided fractionation. But what we also did was we um, profiled all of those fractions that we generated using metabolomics, using mass spectrometry to get a profile of all the small molecules that are present. And then when we did our biological assay, when we added these fractions of the extract to bacteria, we didn't just look at the fractions by themselves. We added pure berberine to every sample and looked at whether the activity was enhanced by the fractions in combination with berberine. So that's a way of getting around this problem of separating and purifying and losing um, the potential combination effects. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the data that came out of that study. This is um, what's called a selectivity ratio plot. Each one of these bars represents a molecule that's detected in the sample. And here, the taller the bar is in the negative direction, because um, we're looking at inhibition of growth by the bacteria. So the taller the bar is, the more strongly that particular molecule is associated with the activity of the extract. And here, all the green arrows are flavonoids in the sample, which turned out to be um, associated strongly with activity. And in this study, we identified one new flavonoid, um, this compound right here. And it was shown to have activity alone um, against um, bacteria. I'm sorry, it was shown to have activity in combination with berberine antimicrobial activity against um, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which as many of you probably know, is a really problematic bacteria that causes infections. So what we were able to do through this process I was just describing is to come up with a series of molecules that um, were actually all flavonoids that appear to contribute to the activity of golden seal, but do not have any direct antimicrobial activity themselves. And these molecules um, turn out to be efflux pump inhibitors. So I'll tell you just briefly how that works. So if you have bacteria that are growing and causing an infection, the idea would be to treat them with an antimicrobial, such as that yellow berberine molecule that you saw in the extract I showed you earlier. Um, but bacteria are clever and they have developed ways to efflux the antimicrobial right outside of their cells. And so this, the antimicrobial is not able to kill the bacteria because the bacteria are just getting rid of it. And an efflux pump inhibitor, such as an alkaloid, 
um, or whatever compound, uh, these flavonoids that were being shown in the previous slide um, that blocks those efflux pump inhibitors will cause the antimicrobial to build up inside the cells and then eventually clear the infection. So um, I've given you an example here of us actually doing identifying um, synergists from the plant golden seal, flavonoids that work as efflux pump inhibitors that synergize the alkaloid berberine, and that was very exciting. But I also wanted to give a little context here and just talk about how challenging these studies are and the many ways that they can go awry or go wrong. So one of those is that um, the biological assay may not detect synergy. So I mentioned earlier today the example of um, artemisia, where it seems like the synergy that occurs when you take artemisia tea occurs because of effects on metabolism, and you might not pick that up in an in vitro study. With white willow bark, it seems like there's an effect on um, digestion potentially, which again may not be picked up in an in vitro assay. So the challenge of extrapolating the assay that's simple to do to allow these synergy studies to an in vivo system is really difficult. And I think it's extremely important when looking at the published literature to think about that um, possibility of the results being in the in vitro assays not being necessarily relevant to the in vivo context. Um, it's also true that no analytical technique detects every single molecule. So sometimes we run into the problem that we don't detect the compounds that are important for activity. And we have to be very careful then in those cases to follow the biological effect rather than rely exclusively on the analytical methods um, to follow the active compounds. Um, there's also the problem of synergists getting separated into different fractions. I talked about that a little bit. Um, this is something that um, can be addressed by recombining fractions or recombining compounds. You might say, why don't you just test the complex mixtures then and not even fractionate them? Um, but and, uh, the, the problem is that if you don't separate the molecules out from each other, you'll never know how they interact together because everything will be changing in concert when you test them. And so the answer will be anything in this extract could be the active thing. So you must separate if you want to start to separate out which, you must separate the extract if you want to start to distinguish which constituents are responsible for activity. And the cha another challenge is that it's not even enough to just get the molecules present at the right, um, in the same samples, they have to be at the right concentration to detect synergy. And you really only see synergy when you haven't maxed out the signal for any one compound, and there's still room for an enhancement in signal. And so um, one of the real challenges with synergy studies is that you have to test over a range of dosages to hit the, the window where you can see combination effects. And um, there's one other challenge that I was going to talk about today, but I think I'm actually kind of short on time. Um, so I'm going to skip through a few slides here um, because I don't want to hog the next time. Um, I will just mention that we have recently published a paper from my group. This just came out. This is ODS and um, NCCIH funded work from one of the carbon centers with um, a new method that is useful for identifying synergists in natural product mixtures. We're calling it interaction metabolomics. Um, I'd love to talk about it more if anybody wants to ask. And this um, paper is available um, online open access. So you can access it yourself or I'll happily send it to you. And in this paper, we looked at a combination of golden seal extracts with pepper extracts, and we saw synergy in those cases and were able to identify the synergists involved as berberine and capsaicin. And this was again, antimicrobial synergy um, due to the efflux pump inhibitory activity of capsaicin and the antimicrobial properties of berberine. And so one more paper I'll mention is this one here from Natural Product Reports that summarizes a lot of the existing methodologies that are useful for studying synergy and also um, talks about some of the case studies that I've mentioned today of, of examples where synergy has been identified in botanical research. And this was work that was done by um, my former student, Lindsay Caesar, who is now an assistant professor at James Madison University running her own research group. Um, I'll finish here by uh, acknowledging the Center for High Content Functional Annotation, which is the group that has been involved 
in a lot of these studies that we've been doing in recent years, and also um, my research group again, and um, a really very grateful to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health and the Office of Dietary Supplements for funding this work. And I will stop there and turn things over to all of you for questions. Another fabulous talk and right on time, which is one of the reasons I love having you as a speaker, Nadja, but by far not the only one. Um, one comment from Walid, um, a scintillating talk to relish. Oh, well, I love that. I think I might have to take a picture of that uh, comment. Thank you. <laughs> I will try to save the, remember to save the chat for you. Um, so one question, a couple of uh, questions are coming in. Um, let me start with the one that just came in from June. Uh, is it common for the chemical constituents that are deemed to possess bioactivity in model systems to fail in eliciting beneficial effects in human participants due to poor oral bioavailability? And are there feasible established methods to enhance bioavailability? So two questions. So that's, June, I think, so what a great question. Um, and certainly, you know, I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't think we have done enough placebo controlled clinical studies to demonstrate this specific thing happening, but I'm guessing that it does happen. And I think it's definitely one of the challenges of extrapolating from an in vitro study where you're adding a molecule to the cells and looking at what happens to a situation where now you're having people consume that molecule, it's going through the digestive tract, it's interacting with the microbiome, it's having to be absorbed. And there's so much difficulty with just getting one molecule absorbed. And now if we're talking about synergy, we might have two molecules that need to be absorbed and get to the active site. And so it becomes a really challenging um, problem. And I think um, that the, the question about how to improve bioavailability is a great one. And I think that it um, there are there's a whole you know study of that of how to best prepare pharmaceuticals in the pharmaceutical field. And that's something we think of a lot, a lot is dissolution and pharmacokinetics and these kinds of things. And so I believe that those same principles can be applied to botanical medicines. And in some cases they are. Um, that's something we think about in our natural product drug interaction clinical studies, which is another project I'm involved with, but it's certainly more complex with a complex mixture than it is with a single compound. And, and that's one of the places where it's really helpful to know what your biologically active molecules are, because you can't look at whether they're bioavailable without knowing who, who you're looking for. Absolutely. So if we know what we're looking for, we can measure plasma levels and, and that sort of thing. But you can't really measure plasma levels of a botanical, if you see what I mean. You have to measure them of a constituent. The point exactly. Thank you. Um, you have we have a question for I guess for you about entourage effect in cannabis. Yeah, great question. So it turns out that the cannabis community has come up with their own word for synergy. They call it the entourage effect, but I think everything I talked about today applies there too. So that's an insightful question. Um, and we have actually been looking at synergy in cannabis in my research group. Interesting that you should ask. Um, we haven't published those findings yet, but we do see antimicrobial synergy for um, extracts from cannabis. And we have been as of yet unable to pin down the molecules that are involved in that phenomenon. But we know that, um, that there are several cannabinoids, um, CBD and CBDA, which have potent antimicrobial effects, but um, there are also some other molecules that seem to enhance those effects in cannabis. And that's something we're thinking about a lot. And it's a great question. And I think that's obviously just um, the other thing that comes up to me in answering that question is that when we're talking about what whether a particular molecule is active, we have to think about what activity we're looking at. So cannabis can be used topically for antimicrobial properties, but that's probably not the major use of cannabis. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the question of what synergists there are is dependent on what biological effect you're looking at. And 
So you kind of have to repeat the studies for each biological effect to see what the key players are and how they work together. And the compounds that are antimicrobial might not be the same ones that have other properties. And the compounds that, that, that are useful in topical application might not be available if you're chewing gummies or if you're inhaling. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think, let's see, one more question. And this was actually a carryover question from the last session that I think is relevant. And the question is, what do you think of using a bioactivity assay as a means to understand a botanical preparation for research? Bioactivity assay. So I guess certainly, you know, one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is that, um, for looking for anti-cancer activity, for example, or for pro-inflammatory or inflammation modulating activity, um, it's those assays are very concentration dependent. So for example, if you're looking at cell killing um, with a botanical in a cancer cell line, um, at some concentration you might see cell, you might see toxicity. One of the important questions would be, is it also toxic to healthy cells? to non-transformed yeah. cells. And the other would be, is that a biologically achievable concentration? Yeah, great or would point, you have Barbara. to go into the lab and modify it? Um, yeah, great I, points. I, I, think, I think always those studies are a good starting point. Those in vitro studies are a good starting point and necessary starting point. But you know, if we see, for example, in, in the realm of cancer research, if we see that a molecule is cytotoxic, that it kills cells, we don't call that anti-cancer activity. We call that cytotoxicity. And then we don't talk about what it does to cancer until it's actually been studied in a tumor model. So it's often that you start with the simple and then move to the more complex. I think I would suggest that we move on if Dr. Samyanath is ready. And then we can take more questions at the end. And it looks like she's ready. Yes, so I am ready. She's let always ready. <laughs> let, let me introduce you. Um, Dr. Amala Samyanath, who is going to wrap this up by actually taking us to the verge of a clinical trial of a botanical and talking about the challenges in doing that, is professor in the neuro neurology department at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, Amala received her pharmacy degree and her PhD from the University of London in the United Kingdom. She's trained as a pharmacognosist. Her research investigates traditional herbal medicines, exploring the validity of their reputed uses and their potential use for evidence-based phytotherapy as a source of novel chemical leads for conventional drug development. Her research has encompassed botanical remedies for diabetes, skin diseases, and she's now focusing on neurodegenerative disorders. Amala has di directed collaborative studies on botanicals spanning their preclinical evaluation and chemical characterization through to translational and clinical studies. And she is currently the principal investigator of the Carbons Botanical Dietary Supplement Research Center at OHSU. And I think she's going to tell you about that as part of her talk. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction, Barbara. And I'm um, happy to be able to present at this practicum. I've really enjoyed all the talks that we've heard since morning. I think they've been really excellent and covering lots of different aspects. And I hope you'll see some of those reflected in my talk right now. Can you see my slides and can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Let me get into presentation mode here. Okay. So uh, the title of my talk is to uh, is optimizing botanical. Let me see some of these uh, toolbars are covering my slides. Um, optimizing botanical dietary supplement evidence for a clinical trial. So how can we design an optimum clinical trial to study a botanical dietary supplement? And uh, as you've heard, uh, I have the honor of, of leading the Benfra Botanical Dietary Supplements Research Center which is part of the CARBON program. And I'll say a little bit about how that fits into the, the work that I'm describing. Okay, so uh, the BENFRA Center, the, the BENFRA is an acronym for Botanicals Enhancing Neurological and Functional Resilience in Aging. And this is part of the CARBON program. And we have conceptualized our center as providing a pipeline for designing 
optimal clinical trials of botanicals. So uh, we, based on uh, work that we've been doing over the years, we've uh, conceptualized this pipeline as requiring initially making sure that the product that you're testing is of the correct identity. You, you heard a lot earlier about the reason, uh, the, the importance of making sure that you're working with the right material and also optimization. And what do I mean by optimization? Mostly I'm talking about uh, making sure that it has the right chemical profile for the kind of activity that you want to see. And so that includes making sure that the starting material that you have contains your putative active compounds, and also that when you have an extraction process, you're able to extract out the compounds of interest. Um, as part of that, of course, you need to identify what the active compounds are. And you'll see that this is not a linear process, it's a back and forth process where having done some work to identify the active compounds, then you can make sure that those are present in your product as you as you move through this, uh, this whole drug uh, discovery or uh, scientific discovery process. It's also important to identify some of the mechanisms by which these compounds and the extract as a whole might be working. Uh, and you can do that both in vitro and also in vivo. One of the advantages of uh, testing your botanical extracts in vivo is that you can uh, obviously look for in vivo efficacy, which could be very different from what you're seeing in in vitro tests. And also in an in vivo system, you can identify what we call translationally relevant biomarkers. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, can you measure things in an in vivo system, uh, a mouse or a rat model, for example, which you're then going to be able to measure in a, in a human being in a clinical trial? Um, so something where you can actually um, uh, take a blood sample, a non-invasive method, is there something that you can identify in your in vivo model, which you could then follow up in your clinical study? And when you have all this information, you can hopefully design a good clinical trial, which would give you a valid uh, answer as to whether that botanical is effective uh, in the way that you, you predict. Um, so one of the areas we're focusing on is cognitive decline. I said the Venfra Center is botanicals enhancing neurological and functional, um, uh, functional? resilience in aging. And one of the things that we need resilience to as we age is um, to prevent cognitive decline. Now, of course, it's not a given, but it's well known that even without any frank disease, there is a decline uh, that can occur uh, in, in cognitive function as one ages. And this is in various different aspects of cognition. And of course, in cases where there's a very specific disease, for example, Alzheimer's disease, some of these declines can be accelerated. And uh, I want to just draw a distinction here between botanical drugs and botanical dietary supplements. We've heard about both during today's talk. Um, in the case of a dietary supplement, mostly this would be used to maintain health. So in both cases, uh, a botanical may promote resilience to a decline in neurological function. Now, in some cases, we're talking about healthy individuals who are aging normally, but aging, as I've just mentioned, is actually a risk factor for a decline in cognitive function. And if you're using a botanical to just maintain good cognitive function as you age, this would be defined as a dietary supplement. On the other hand, you may have a disease like Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia or something where you are seeing um, cognitive decline. And in this case, if the botanical is being used to reverse or slow the disease progression, then you would define that as a botanical drug. Now, in either case, you really need to, in order to really tell if your uh, botanical is, in, is effective, either as a dietary supplement or a botanical drug, it's important to have a good quality clinical trial in order to support the evidence-based use of this botanical. And that pipeline that I just described is important for that. Um, now, some of these publications have already been mentioned. So there've been some really nice publications coming out um, both from our chair today. Dr. Barbara Sorkin has first authored one of these papers and then also from other um, program officers at the NIH who've looked at the kind of trials that have been done on natural products over the years. And as you've already heard, these have not always yielded um, 
great results, and this might be because of the way the trials were designed. So there have been some very nice publications giving guidelines on how these natural product um, trials should be designed. And what I'm showing here is really my interpretation of, of what's presented in those, in those papers. So if you want to optimize a trial of a botanical product, we can uh, describe this, this optimization process by looking at a common acronym that's used to describe clinical trials, PICO. This is like the population intervention controls and outcomes. So let's start here with population. Obviously, if you're going to look at a specific botanical for a particular use, it's important that the population should be relevant to, your, to that endpoint, whether you're talking about a health outcome or a disease outcome, and also representative both in terms of age, sex, and race, it's important. And we heard this morning about effectiveness versus efficacy, you know, in, in a wider context, um, effectiveness in a wider context. And so as you go through your trials, it's important that the population should be representative of all the end users of that uh, particular botanical. And also very important, it should be, your study should be adequately powered. You should have enough samples or enough numbers of people in your clinical trials to give you a valid um, answer. The intervention is really important. And this is where we've heard a lot today about um, you know, variability in botanicals and so on. And so the intervention that you use in your clinical trial, um, it, it works best if it's had really good evidence of likely efficacy from your preclinical studies. And if you've used a particular type of preparation in your, in your preclinical studies, Again, it makes sense to use a very similar preparation in your clinical trial. So if you've used an, an aqueous extract in your preclinical studies, if you then do your clinical study uh, with, a, with an ethanol extract, you might actually be dealing with a completely or, or a very different set of um, phytochemical profiles in, in those two different extracts. So try to mimic the preclinical, the, try to mimic in your clinical study whatever you did in your preclinical study. Also, um, it, it really helps to have a knowledge of what the active compounds might be so we can ensure that they're present and stable in our product. And then of course, you would have to select a dose which seems appropriate for your human uh, subjects and also a duration of treatment. Um, in designing the trial, we've heard the importance of having a placebo control and randomization and blinding because these all add to the scientific rigor. So then when we come to the outcomes, this is where, you know, really what we want at the end of the day is to know, does it work? So, and there's a, there's a desire to rush into an efficacy outcome to see, does it, does it, for example, in the case that I've been describing, does this, does this botanical prevent cognitive decline? But really the guidelines state that they say, hold on, before you get to that efficacy trial, it's important to do some other types of studies first. And one thing we've talked about today in, in, uh, in the discussion and in the talks is about the bioavailability and pharmacokinetics of the active compounds. So if you have a particular product, it is important to make sure that you can show absorption of the active compounds from that product before you go into your clinical study. Secondly, an efficacy trial can often uh, need very large numbers of participants, and you might have to uh, give the treatment for a longish period of time, and they can be very expensive to, to do that. And it's kind of helpful if you can, prior to going into this very large efficacy trial, do some kind of a biomarker study where you demonstrate that your product can actually um, affect the, the targets that you are anticipating. And you'll see an example of that as I go through my talk. Really, it's showing that the mechanisms that you've seen in your preclinical studies are still relevant when you give that same botanical to a human. And then having done that, you can having shown that the active compounds are bioavailable and that you are seeing the same mechanism in your human subjects as you saw in your preclinical models, then you have a fairly strong case for going into a, a, a sort of resource intensive, expensive efficacy trial. And of course, it's always important to monitor safety and tolerability in all these different phases of your study. Now, these things like matching your 
preclinical and clinical products, choosing the right dose and so on, and doing the bioavailability and biomarker studies. These can be considered de-risking strategies. In other words, you are trying to reduce the risk of having an invalid um, efficacy trial at the end of the day. It doesn't mean that your product is going to prove to be active, but if you've shown all these other things, you can have a greater uh, confidence that whatever efficacy or lack of efficacy you, you observe in your clinical trial really is valid. And it's not because you used the wrong product at the wrong dose and nothing was absorbed from it uh, and so on. So um, coming back to the Benfra Center, we're actually studying two specific botanicals. One is Centella asiatica and the other is Withania somnifera. These are known uh, in trade as Gotu Kola and Ashwagandha, respectively. Uh, both of these are Rasayan or rejuvenating herbs. And so we believe that they have the capacity to provide resilience to age-related challenges, particularly cognitive um, function. Um, in terms of our pipeline, uh, we, when, we, when our center began uh, now just over three years ago, um, we, uh, ashwagandha was relatively new to us, but we had already come a long way with our study of Centella asiatica. And really for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on the work that we've done on uh, goat cola or Centella asiatica. So a bit of background about this botanical. Uh, this is a great example of uh, a plant that spans both medicinal and uh, medicinal activity and is used as a, as a food. This is a plant that grows in, in tropical countries, particularly in Asia, where it is an important food plant. Uh, it's used in salads and so on, and it's used to make refreshing drinks, but it also has very strong uh, medicinal properties. And um, one of the, the relevant properties for this particular talk is that it's used as a rasayan or rejuvenating herb, and it has a very strong reputation as a nerve tonic or memory booster. And for this reason, when we first began working with Centella, it was not in the context of Centella as a dietary supplement, but very much more with our eye on developing it as a botanical drug. And so we didn't, we've, over the years, uh, as a collaborative group, done a number of preclinical studies on Centella asiatica with a view to seeing if it might be useful in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And this slide kind of summarizes about 15 years of work. And uh, what we've essentially done is work with a water extract of the herb, uh, which I'm going to acronym as CAW. Why did we choose to do a water extract? This was based on a combination of the traditional way the herb is used. It's often used as a tea or a decoction, and also some previous studies by other researchers where they'd compared a number of different extracts made from the same batch of plant material, a hexane extract, a chloroform extract, an ethanol extract, and a water extract and found that the water extract had the best effects on improving cognitive function in a, in a rodent model. So based on this, we uh, began to work with this water extract and we've tested it in a bunch of different models. We've tested it in vitro, in uh, cell lines, as well as isolated primary neurons from mice, and also tested it in vivo, in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, as well as simply aged mice and Drosophila models as well. And, uh, and also we've done uh, various chemical studies where we've tried to uh, elucidate what the active compounds of this botanical are in relation to its neurological effects and also developed analytical methods to measure these and other compounds in the plant material and also in plasma, because as I mentioned, some of those bioavailability and pharmacokinetic studies are important. So this is a summary and I'd like to I can't tell you about all the studies that we've done, but I'd like to pick a few to just illustrate uh, my um, what I'm trying to convey. I want to acknowledge that this work, this is definitely not a one-person show, it's a multi-person show, and I've had the, the joy of working with really excellent collaborators in this study who all bring different types of expertise, uh, both neurological, uh, neurobiological. Uh, Dr. Quinn is a neurologist, Dr. Doris Kretschmar is an expert in the Drosophila model. Kirsten Wright is an ND, and then our wonderful research assistants as well. And we have a lot of publications which you can find on the Benfra website if you're interested in, in following up on these. Um, so I mentioned that we have 
looked at uh, the CAW in a number of different models, both uh, two mouse models of, of Alzheimer's disease, as well as just aged mice. And uh, what I'd like to do is to give you some results from the aged mice, because these are not diseased mice. This kind of reflects maybe looking at uh, go to cola or centella as a dietary supplement where you're trying to see if it can in influence um, uh, cognitive function. So the paradigm for this mouse study is that mice are either just allowed to be in their cages, they're given their ordinary drinking water, or we uh, spike CAW into their drinking water and they receive this for a period of five weeks. And during this time, after two weeks, we start the cognitive testing. And then at the end of five weeks, we're able to uh, uh, sacrifice the mice and then get their brain and blood uh, and other tissues and uh, evaluate those. Now, the point was made in one of the talks earlier that you can do things with in vivo models that you can't do in humans. And obviously getting a brain sample is, is one example of those of that. Okay, so here's the results of uh, one of the studies that we've done. In this study, we've taken aged mice so these are mice that are aged 20, year, 20 months uh, old. And we've done this both in male and female mice. And this is one of the many cognitive tests that we're able to apply. So in this test, a mouse is exposed to two objects within a chamber. Uh, you take the mouse out of the chamber and you return it to the cha chamber after two hours. And in the meantime, you've moved one of the objects to a new location. And then you repeat that after 24 hours and you've moved the object to yet another location. Now, how does this test work? Well, mice are inherently exploratory. They love to explore something that's new and different. And so you would expect that if the mouse remembered the objects from their previous location, it would spend more time exploring the objects that, that's in the new location compared to the one that hasn't moved. And this is what we can measure. We can videotape these mice when they're put back and then calculate how much time they spent with each object. So here you'll see that the white bars represent the time the mice spend with the object in the old location, whereas the dark bars represent the time they spent with the object in the new location. So if you look at the two hour test, um, with the female mice and the male mice, both of them show a little bit of a preference for the object in the new location. The, in the males, this did not reach statistical significance. Remember, these are old mice. Um, so their memory, it, that we've done other tests to show that their memory does decline with age. Um, but in both cases, you'll see that when they had CAW in their drinking water, they show a much enhanced pro, uh, preference for the object in the new location. Uh, demonstrating that they have a much improved memory. And the same is true here where you have the 24 hour test at 24 hours, neither the females nor the males show a great preference for the objects in the new location. Uh, whereas when they've been treated with CAW, they do in fact show, show a really enhanced preference for the new location, suggesting that their memory has improved. And so we have a number of data uh, data from different models and different types of mice and different types of uh, cognitive tests as well, which has supported our belief that this water extract really does improve memory. And what about mechanism? Um, sorry, these are this is a very busy slide with lots of graphs, but I'd like to just say that the take home message is what we did was we looked at two brain regions and looked at brain uh, gene expression. And when you look at the expression of mitochondrial electron transport genes, so these are the genes that are responsible for the electron transport chain, which is how the brain generates ATP. And that's how memory is, that's how uh, energy is stored, of course. We find that the centella treated mice show an enhancement in the gene expression for these mitochondrial electron transport chain genes. Another very important set of genes that are, uh, that are whose expression is enhanced by centella is the antioxidant response element genes. So these are there's a there's a pathway of antioxidant response which is stimulated by a particular transcription factor called NERF2. So there's a there's a pathway. Let's just say that NERF2 is the key, key player here. If you increase the, the the production of NERF2, then you improve antioxidant response. In other words, the ability to deal with oxidative stress. And this was also seen in these two brain regions. 
Um, we also saw an increase in synaptic gene expression. So synapses are, of course, the connection between, between nerves. And we found that there was increased synaptic genes in the hippocampus and frontal cortex. These are two brain regions. And, and this was another thing that the centella seemed to be doing. So this all speaks to the mechanism that seems to be underlying this cognitive improvement that the centella extract is, is uh, inducing. And then some really exciting results. These are from mouse primary hippocampal neurons. So this is not the brain. These are just neurons that have been taken out of a mouse brain and then treated in a dish with the centella extract. So wild type just means ordinary mice and TG2576 uh, mice are an AD, uh, a model of Alzheimer's disease that gets these brain amyloid plaques. You might've heard that amyloid plaques are a key feature of Alzheimer's disease. And in this case, um, these are, these are um, neurons that have been isolated from the brains that have this, uh, a gene that uh, induces these amyloid plaques. And you can already see that these TG mice don't have as much branching uh, the, these neurons don't have as much branching as the primary neurons from the ordinary mice. Um, and that's to be expected because it's a toxic effect of the beta amyloid uh, that's present there. For both of these cases, if you treat them with this centella extract, you see this dramatic increase in branching. And that would, uh, that would kind of uh, lead to better synaptic connections between the neurons. So this was really exciting stuff. And this just tells us some of the mechanisms by which we believe that Centella works. And I want to kind of draw, a, um, um, say why this is important, both for the use of Centella as a botanical drug or as a dietary supplement. Because uh, when you look at Alzheimer's disease, there are multiple different things going wrong in, in the Alzheimer's brain. I've already mentioned that they have this uh, buildup of amyloid protein in an Alzheimer's disease brain. There's also another protein called tau, which gets abnormally phosphorylated and it kind of clogs up the neurons and so on. But neither of those seem to be the target for um, Centella, uh, at least in the work that we've done so far. But what we are seeing is an effect on two other things that are happening in an Alzheimer's brain, where you have a lot of oxidative stress, you have a lot of uh, oxygen-free radicals more than usual, and you also have dysfunctional mitochondria in uh, an Alzheimer's disease brain. And both of these factors are being improved by Centella. So Centella improves antioxidant uh, capacity of the brain, and it also improves mitochondrial function. And the interesting thing is that both oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction are also involved in non-pathological aging. So as we age, uh, it is known that uh, in just in normal aging, you have increased oxidative stress and reduced mitochondrial function. So this speaks to the fact that when used as a dietary supplement, Centella could actually provide resilience against uh, cognitive decline induced by these two uh, mechanisms. Now, uh, what about active compounds? It's important to actually identify what the active compounds are in Centella that may be responsible for these effects. And to cut a long story short, we've found that two groups of compounds seem to both contribute to the biological effects of, of the CAW. One group are the triterpenes, and the other group are these compounds called cafoalquinic acids. And in the upcoming slides, you'll see the triterpenes abbreviated to TT and the cafoalquinic acids as CQAs. Um, these fall into two groups, monocafoalquinic acids and dicafoalquinic acids, which just refers to how many uh, cafoal groups there are attached to the quinic acid group. That's probably a bit of too much detail there, maybe. Um, but I do want to point out that in all the literature, the triterpenes are the compounds that classically have been cited as being the active compounds of Centella asiatica. Uh, but we found in some of our work, some of our in vitro studies that the triterpenes were not effective in those models, whereas the CQAs were. And that's why we're actually following up on both these groups of molecules. And this again speaks to the complexity that you heard about earlier, that you can't in the activity of a botanical to just one single compound. In fact, here we're seeing not just multiple compounds, but multiple groups of compounds as well. So trying to unravel how these two groups might interact and which might be more important, 
one of the things we've done is to develop analytical methods where you can measure each of these, these different cafoalquinic acids and the different triterpenes in how, measure how much of those there are in the CAW crude extract. And so these are all the percentage figures for one particular batch that we've been testing. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that if you added up these numbers, this would come to only around five or six percent. So in other words, there's another 94 percent of CAW that we don't actually uh, know. It, it belongs to neither of these groups. Um, and that will be important later. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here except to say that um, for dendritic hey. arborization, yes, sorry, is there a question? Okay. Um, yes. Hello, is there a question? Okay, so when we, one of the things we wanted to do was to see which of these compounds were important for dendritic arborization. And I just want to mention there's this process called shoal analysis, where you can count the number of times your dendrites intersect with these con concentric circles and express the arborization or branching as a, a graph that looks like this. And then you can measure the area under the curb as a quantitative measure of um, arborization. So when we compared the entire extract, the CAW extract, to the CAW and triterpenes. And I have to say that we here we use them in the concentrations that they were present in the extract. So for these, it was these very low concentrations here. For the triterpenes, it's slightly higher. And what we found interestingly is that both the CQAs and the triterpenes have this brand, have this effect on arborization. And they both kind of are very similar to the total extract here. And one very strange effect was that when you mix them, they seem to actually inhibit arborization compared to the control. And yet we know that when this mixture is present as part of CAW, you get this enhancing effect. So I, I don't really have an explanation for this, but I just want to point out that this shows that there's a lot more going on with these mixtures of compounds than we can necessarily um, understand. And uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is, of course, this is an in vitro test. And so we don't know whether how much this actually represents what happens in vivo. So moving on to, um, sorry, I just want to say that when we, we also tested some of these compounds individually and found that some individual compounds at concentrations similar to what they're present in, in the CAW extract were also um, active. Not all of them were, but they also were active in both wild type and in some cases the, the transgenic hippocampal neurons as well. So what about, is this, is this relevant in vivo? So one in vivo model that we've used is the Drosophila model. I see I'm running way over time, so I'll try, I might skip through some of these slides. Um, so uh, in the Drosophila model, this again is something that seems to be relevant for aging. So we have a, a way that we can measure phototaxis, in other words, the ability of these flies to go towards light. And this ability, is, it's, a, it's a combination of both the kind of neurological effect and uh, just a locomotion effect. And what we find is that as both male and female flies age, so this is age at, on this axis, their tendency or ability to move towards light decreases. And so uh, this is kind of a model for loss of neurological function or cognitive function in, in aging. And we find that, you know, we, we decided that we would test them starting around four weeks, which is 28 days. So in this model, if you, if you have them on for four weeks on their regular feed food, and then you mix CAW into their food for that next two weeks, and then you measure their ability uh, in this phototaxis assay, the CAW is able to dramatically improve phototaxis in these flies. And the question is, which of the compounds are active? Again, here, um, if you compare the CAW, which is here, if you look at the triterpenes alone, the CQAs alone, or this combination of triterpenes and CQAs, you'll find that they, we found that they were all active. Now, why is it that this plus that uh, when you combine them, why isn't it bigger? Well, one reason could be something that um, Dr. Nadia Czech mentioned, that if you're already getting a maximum effect, 
then you can't make it any better. We're not producing super flies or anything. So what we really need to do is to do a nice dose response and try these at different doses. And this is where we run into a practical issue that you know, it then becomes a very resource intensive exercise to try each of these groups at, at different doses and so on. And um, I just wanna mention that when we tested all of these compounds individually, we did not see an effect, which suggests that they really do need to be in those combinations in order to see that effect on um, phototaxis. Um, now, I think I'll, I'll just skip through this very quickly to say that we have also tested um, the CAW in mice at different doses, and we've compared the effects uh, this, this, uh, to, of this in, in mice, compared the um, CAW to the CQAs and the triterpenes, and again, this mixture of triterpenes and CQAs. So this is just comparing, just, uh, uh, there isn't time to go into this in detail, but just take this axis here as a measure of memory. And so the wild type mice, so these are just ordinary mice, have fairly good memory in this particular test, uh, whereas the 5X mice, which have these amyloid plaques in their brain, have poorer memory. Um, all these treatments did actually uh, improve memory to some extent. They were all kind of similar to the wild type. They were not significantly different from the wild type, um, although they didn't necessarily all show a significant improvement from the vehicle treatment. But the um, CQAs and this mixture of triterpenes and CQAs both showed uh, an improvement uh, from the untreated animals. So again, in this mouse model, again, we were seeing evidence of the activity of these groups of compounds. So moving forward, and just to say that there's also a lot of literature, again, supporting both of these chemical groups as being important for the activity of centella in its neurological effects, particularly in cognition. I'm sorry, I had to rush through that a bit. We can go back if there's time for questions. So working with uh, our wonderful collaborators at Oregon State University, they have developed some great uh, methods for measuring these triterpenes and CQAs, as well as just general untargeted metabolomics type of measurement of the compounds in Centella Asiatica. And in my lab, we've developed methods to measure these particular, the triterpenes, as well as the uh, CQA compounds in plasma of mice that have been treated with, with centella. And we've also uh, been able to apply these same methods to measure these compounds in human plasma. And so now we're at, we were at the point where we could move from preclinical into clinical studies. And the basis for this was the preclinical studies that suggested that Centella does improve cognitive function. And we've also seen multiple mechanisms which seem to be relevant to brain health. And therefore, Centella is likely to have a good safety profile based on both its what we've seen in mice as well as the fact that it's a food plant. But of course, we always have to uh, confirm that through our studies. So now moving into clinical trials, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, it's important to select the right dose. And for this, we used a process called interspecies scaling and found that something like two grams a day or four grams a day of centella would be a suitable dose that mimicked the mouse doses that we'd use to see an effect. Um, and then what we've now done is developed a, a product which can be used in clinical trials. And we've published our experience with developing this product in this publication. Um, and I just want to say that we've developed not just a, a product that contains the CAW, but also a placebo that matches it, which can be used in our clinical trial. And this was kind of quite challenging. We had to match the, the taste and color and everything of this. And we decided that two and uh, four grams particularly is a lot to give in capsule form. So we've made it as a kind of powder that can be reconstituted into a drink. And um, so we had to add excipients that had you know, made it taste good and so on, and also gave it a certain color. And so we've now developed a placebo and a product that we can use in clinical studies. So one thing that we found in doing this was obviously we had to source uh, Centella to make this product. And these are different 
uh, batches of centella that we got from different commercial suppliers. And when we measured the triterpenes, for example, in these different batches, we found a whole variety. So just to take one compound, azeotecoside, you'll see how variable the levels of azeotecoside were in these different batches. And it was important to us to try and match the triterpene levels to the two batches that we'd used in our mouse studies. So what we ultimately ended up doing was mixing um, number three, which has very little, and number six, which has a lot, for example, of this compound to try and get some kind of medium level. And it was the same kind of story with the capwell quinic acids. And I wanna say that we also have done some untargeted analysis, and this is a principal component analysis, which shows how different all these different, and this, this looks at all the different detectable compounds in these extracts, not just the triterpenes and CQAs, but it just does show just how variable this plant material can be and how important it is to do this chemical analysis to um, try and match your, your, your profile. Pesticides was another problem pesticides and heavy metals we found in many of these batches. So we had to keep an eye on that. And we found a couple of batches that had acceptable levels. And this was our very elaborate uh, manufacturing process to make our product. And the FDA, which I'll mention in a second, required us to do some stability studies to show that in the in, during our trials, these triterpenes and CQAs would still be present as we, as we went through our trials. So we've also had to do some stability studies here to ensure that. Uh, we did find that we needed an IND, and this was mostly because, of course, as I told you, we our work was mostly focused on investigating CAW for the treatment of a disease. And also this product, this kind of concentrated uh, aqueous extract is not currently marketed either as a drug or as a dietary supplement. And so we need, did need to have an IND in order to, um, to proceed with clinical trials. And these are some of the things we had to do, document prior human experience, provide detailed accounts of how we're making our product, and also do a few non-clinical pharmacology and toxicity studies, very minor ones. Um, so we were able to use the widespread use of uh, Centella asiatica, both as a food and, a diet, and as a dietary supplement, and in certain previous trials as evidence for safety, likely safety uh, for, to the FDA in our IND application. Uh, we also did, we also took uh, a bunch of different organs from the mice that we treated, and Dr. Randy Walter helped us with histology of those and found that we really did not see any abnormalities in these organs, which gave us some confidence in, in the likely safety of this extract. And then um, also did some studies to show that this CAW has low potential for drug interactions uh, based on its uh, lack of inhibiting or inducing cytochrome P450. Um, we then put in our IND application and we were able to begin with our clinical trials. The first trial that we did uh, was a pharmacokinetic study. So we've compared two doses of, we're calling it CAP, Centella Asiatica product. We've compared two doses in humans. And um, in this case, remember that the pharmacokinetic study was one of the first things that we were recommended to do. And uh, this has been published and we've seen some very nice pharmacokinetic curves with the triterpenes, and I'm not showing you all the curves, but we've been able to also detect CQAs and their metabolites in the plasma of these uh, of humans who are given this Centella product. Um, and also we were able to detect many of these compounds in their urine. Uh, and so now currently we've started a trial in uh, participants with Alzheimer's disease. We've decided to just use one dose, and this is a placebo controlled trial. And going back to this issue of mechanism, here we're not looking at the ultimate efficacy endpoint, which is uh, memory. What we're doing is just trying to find uh, if we can see uh, safety, of course, and also evidence of target engagement, which in this case, we're look, going to do some brain imaging, which will tell us whether the mitochondrial activity in the brain has improved. And we're also doing some urine and plasma analysis to look for markers of oxidative stress. Remember, those were the two mechanisms that I identified at the beginning. 
So that's the end of my talk. I've really taken longer than I expected. I'm sorry, I hope we still have time for a few questions, but I want to acknowledge all the people who've contributed to different aspects of this study, all our uh, funders, much of which has come from the NIH. Uh, it's only this latest trial that's funded by the Alzheimer's Association. We've had funding from the VA as well. And so let me finish by thanking you for your attention and I'll be very happy to take any questions if we have time for them. Thank you. We do have time. You were all, really all my speakers, fabulously on time. And I wonder, I'm wondering whether Ina and Naja, you can come back on, on your cameras and turn on your microphones and go ahead and maybe starting with um, Ina, go ahead and ask Amala your excellent question. <laughs> So my question was, um, first of all, wonderful presentation. Was it difficult for the mice to drink sufficiently of the spiked drinking water? Mm -hmm. with the, with well, we, we do, we do uh, monitor the, the amount of fluids that they drink, and we didn't find any difference between the treated and untreated mice. So it doesn't seem to affect their drinking. I've, I've tasted the CAW that we've made. It doesn't taste so great, but the mice don't seem to mind it for some reason. Um, one thing that is difficult is that the mice are housed, in, they're group housed. So you have three or four mice in a cage. So we can't be sure that any individual, we don't, we don't know how, many, how much any individual mouse is drinking. We only know how much they drank as a group. And that might account for some of the variability we see in, in the biological effects within a group. Right, but you're comparing with the control, and if the yes. control drinks the same amount of mm -hmm. water, you might level it out or not? Yeah, so we, we haven't seen a difference in overall consumption per cage between plain water and CAW. Okay. At, at any That's, of the doses. Yeah, a very important question. You always wonder when you're giving a botanical to an animal model, whether they are perhaps not consuming less of it. And I think that was a question that was very much asked about the fruit flies with right. the... Yeah. yeah. And so similarly with the fruit flies, we've done some studies to show that, so what you can do is mix a bit of blue dye in the food and then you can extract that blue dye out of the flies and see, and there again, we found that there wasn't an effect on consumption. Particularly if you don't see an effect, then you wonder, is it because they're just not eating it? And, and Nadja, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Absolutely. So yeah. thank you so much, Amal. I'm always really uh, impressed by everything you do and so uh, such rigorous application of botanicals in clinical studies. I think your group is really the leaders on this. Um, it's great to see. So um, I keep, I always think about this challenge, like we talked about um, ser several groups of constituents in the Centella asiatica that seem to be responsible for the effects that you're seeing. Um, and I think you talked about data quantifying some of those compounds in plasma mm -hmm. in your clinical studies. And I wondered if you could comment on this conundrum of like sort of the, the, asso the association that is there, that the compounds are there and you're seeing an effect, but then it's hard to establish causality because you're treating with multiple compounds at once. Um, and I know you did a really nice job with the fruit flies where you're comparing the pure compounds to the mm -hmm. extract, but obviously you can't do that very um, with in a very easy way in the clinical study. Um, so how do you how do you really make the draw the conclusion that those are the compounds responsible for the effects in the humans? Is that because you then go back and do mechanistic studies? I think that the, the uh, as you say, the only way you could really know that for sure is to give the compounds on their own, either individually or as groups, uh, not just give them within this extract. You don't really know. So really you have to kind of make an educated guess based on all the other studies that you've done. Um, uh, and I, I think I don't have an answer for that, except to say that this is this, it's kind of theoretical. The other thing you could do is to see whether the kind of plasma levels you're achieving are similar to what your what is causing an effect in your in vitro system or your or your or your in vivo test to see whether there's a there's a correlation between your human plasma levels and the mouse plasma levels and so on. We're actually seeing much higher levels of the triterpenes in humans than in some of our mouse studies. 
which is interesting. Um, the uh, other the other approach that has been suggested mm -hmm. by one of our former botanical research centers is the knockout approach. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do this in a clinical trial, but mm -hmm. you could do it in an animal model where you. Yeah. Um, deplete your extract mm -hmm. of CQAs and triterpenes. It would, since you're looking at multiple compounds, it would be more complex. But if you depleted it of one or one or the other of those, and the effect went away, I think that would be very strong evidence that you need yeah. that compound. That's right. That. Uh, I mean, you can definitely do those in those in vivo and so on models. But I guess that you then have to do it in, to really answer Nadia's question of how do you show that? How do you know that's what's happening in humans? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the only way is to give them as as those compounds. Yeah, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that question. I think uh, that's a good answer, though. <laughs> thank you. We have a question about um, uh, Centella being a functional part of almost all memory improvement targeting supplement formulations. Um, do you have any information about synergism with gardenia extracts um, or how they might uh, compare to some of the approved drugs for mm -hmm. AD and for ALS? So we don't yet have that information, of course. I mean, there's two different things there. So in terms of comparing to the, the approved drugs for AD and ALS, well, for the AD, for example, those the, the recently approved ones target amyloid and they remove beta amyloid from the brain. And uh, we have, we've not seen, we're getting mixed results in our models as to whether CAW actually targets amyloid or not. In some, in some experiments, there seems to be a slight reduction, in others there isn't. So from that point of view, it seems to have a different mechanism from the Biogen, the recently approved uh, drugs for AD. Um, the ALS one, I'm, I'm not remembering what the mechanism there is, but definitely things like mitochondrial function and antioxidant effects are common across several different neurological diseases. And so, in fact, there's an interest here at OHSU in looking at Centella Asiatica for other neurological diseases as well. Um, we haven't looked at synergy with things like gardenia extracts. That would be interesting for sure. And I think that's, that's the next stage. And for all these, of course, it's always going to be easiest to start with the in vivo or in vitro models before we go into clinical trials for those. You know, one of the things that fascinates me about what you're seeing with the for the role of mitochondrial mm -hmm. um, function is that, of course, one of the roles of tau is to transport mitochondria mm -hmm. in neuronal projections. Yes. Right. They might it might all be uh, related in some way. <laughs> That's right. And even the mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with the increased oxidative stress. And so that they are all correlated. And I think that would be the next level of investigation to see exactly what are the mechanisms, the, you know, the detailed mechanisms by which these are working. And maybe there we'll see a differentiation between the effects of these different compounds. And I'm, it, since I think we have a minute or two, perhaps, for some final discussion, if people can stay, and if you need to go, tell me. Um, but and, and before, just to make sure I have time, I want to thank you all for fabulous presentations. Um, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> amazing. But I'm wondering whether you, you could perhaps take turns commenting on, in these chemically complex products, how do you know when a product is the same as another product? You, you sort of brought this up, Amala, trying to sit, make sure your clinical product is the same as the product that you're using in the, in the mouse and, and fly, fly models. Well, I, I think you can never make sure, you can never be sure that it's absolutely identical. You can only define the parameters that you're trying to match. So in our case, it was trying to keep the triterpenes and CQAs constant, but it's obvious that there's other things that are going to change, especially if you're using a very crude extract. So I think it is difficult. The other thing is to have some kind of control over the, the production chain and always try and you know get your botanical from the same place grown under the same conditions and so on. But that's also uh, quite difficult. So I think the best thing you can do is to just try and define certain parameters within that mishmash that you're trying to keep constant from batch to batch. Do you do a bioassay as well as the chemistry? Good. Yes, you could do a bioassay. 
And then again, we run into this question of which bioassay is most relevant for the clinical effects. Um, I, I think I want to stay with the general questions. There is one for you, Amala, about comparing CAW with other plants with similar cathayol compounds in them. Mm -hmm. uh, but Nadja, any thoughts on, on sufficiently similar? And also, Ina and Ella, you know, when people are using these botanicals, sometimes they're fresh, sometimes they're dried. Um, do they expect them to have the same effect? Yeah, I want Ella to comment on that because she has been looking at, uh, I pronounce it as Arjimona Mexicana, but uh, the, the correct English pronunciation may be different, but it's a plant species that's used for women's health popularly by Haitian women in New York City, and there is some adulteration going on, and Ella has been testing this with her lab work. Ella, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's really kind of the the biggest part of my laboratory work right now is when I go out and collect the plant in New York City, it's kind of either sold dry or fresh, and then it's also sold processed and unprocessed. And I've seen differences in the bioactivity and the chemistry, um, particularly like in at that plant contains a lot of berberine. So I've seen different levels of berberine um, based on how it's processed. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to get to the bottom of with my experiments right now. And this is one of the ones that's used for vaginal infections? Yes. I love so it, makes, it would have berberine. Mm -hmm, it does. And some other um, related alkaloids as well. Ella, do you also want to comment on the adulteration that we found in some uh, packages? Uh, oh, yeah, that's more, that's more, not so much, well, I guess it's also used for women's health, but I was working with an undergraduate, um, and Ina was also helping me work with this undergraduate a couple summers ago, and looking at guinea lupoids, which is a plant that uses chew sticks, and you could see that there were like these morphological differences in the, the twigs that were being sold in these packages. And when we tested them using LCMS, we did see that they were not the same, they were not chemically similar, so probably not the same species. And um, Nadja. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what everyone else has said is super helpful on this point. And what I would add is that we address this question a lot when we're doing clinical studies as part of the drug interaction project that I am involved with. So this is a project where we give, wasn't what I talked about today, but this is a project where we give participants botanical medicines and pharmaceutical preparations at the same time. And we're looking at impact on metabolism of pharmaceutical preparations by botanicals. And one, one approach that we've taken for that study is to purchase commercially available materials for the study. And we start by purchasing somewhere upwards of 40 different preparations based on what's sold commercially, um, what's the best sellers. And then we do what we call untargeted metabolomics on those, which I talked about a bit during my talk, where we're looking at a profile of all the detectable compounds in those extracts, and then compare all those to each other using um, multivariate statistical approaches. And then Ultimately, we kind of try to find the center of that group of something that seems to be pretty representative. And then we stick with that same source and that same lot number throughout the whole clinical study. So of course, we recognize that still whatever we're studying is going to be different from some other products that people are purchasing, but at least we have a sense, a snapshot of what is out there, and we try to choose something that is actually being used by the public, and then we try to at least make sure that it's not changing throughout our study. So that's kind of the best we can do for that, but I think I think um, I really like the approach Amala has taken as well when they're working directly with the distributors and generating their own materials and trying to optimize for particular compounds. So I think those are kind of the two different approaches. Either you go for what's commercially available and you try to at least have a good sense of what's there and use the same batch throughout your study um, and how it compares to other things that are commercially available, or you make your own product to your own specifications. Yeah. And that paper that you described, I think Josh Kellogg is the first author on it, K-E-L-L-G. Yeah, yeah I could put that in the chat if, if we have time. I'll try to do that. Yeah. Um, so there are not really any new questions that haven't been answered, and we are beyond our time. And I'm just so grateful to all of you for adding so much to our practicum. People really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Thank so, you for being our leader, Barbara. It was great. Yes, it was. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for Thank all the you. Thank today. you so much. I think we are done for today.
Um, I'm going to save the chat and okay, great. thank you until we meet. Bye.